One of the problems we face with encryption is how to securely share secret keys. Think about opening a secure connection to a site that you've never been to before. What keys do you use? How do you share these keys? And how do you stop someone from stealing these keys? We're discussing this and much more in this video. If you've been with me for the last two videos, you will know about a type of encryption called symmetric encryption. This is where we have a secret key and we use a cipher to encrypt some private information. We can then use the same key to decrypt later on. The alternative to this is asymmetric encryption, which is relatively new as far as encryption is concerned. Asymmetric encryption uses two different keys. One key may be used for encryption and the other will be used for decryption. These keys are always a pair and we need to use both. So why two keys? The reason is that one of the keys is public and the other is private. Yes, you heard me right. We take one of the keys and we give it to anyone who wants it. We still keep the private key to ourselves though. No one else is allowed to have this key. The public private nature of asymmetric encryption earns it the more common name public key encryption. As the two keys work together, we can encrypt with either one of these keys and use the other for decryption. Let's say that this is my key pair and you want to send me a message. You can have my public key, no worries there. Using my public key, you can then encrypt your message and send it to me. If anyone intercepts the ciphertext, there's nothing they can do as they don't have the corresponding private key. I'm the only one who holds the private key, so only I can decrypt the message. A common cipher that uses public key cryptography is called RSA, which is the cornerstone behind many certificates that are used to secure websites. In the last video, I mentioned that authentication was an interesting way to use encryption. So imagine that I want to prove my identity to you. Here is a simplified way that we could approach this. You could take a random message, complicated enough to make it unguessable, and then encrypt it with my public key. At this point, I'm the only one who can decrypt the message. So if I can decrypt it, get the random message back out, and then send it back to you, you can then compare this with the original message you sent me. And if the messages are the same, then I've proven that I am who I say I am, as I've proven that I'm in possession of my private key. And similar to this is digital signatures, which are commonly used with software to prove that they are from a genuine source. Imagine that I want to send you a file and I want to prove that I was the author of that file. I can create a signature of some sort and encrypt it with my private key. Perhaps we could use a hash of the file. I can then attach the encrypted signature to the file. Anyone can use my public key to decrypt the signature and that's fine as it's not really a secret. The point is that only I could encrypt a message that is decryptable with the public key. Upon receiving the file, you could generate a hash of the file and compare it to the hash in the signature. If they're the same, then you can trust that this file has indeed come from me. Of course, these examples are very simplified, but you can get an idea of how we can use public key cryptography. When using encryption over the network, which is better, secret key ciphers or public key algorithms? Secret key ciphers are very fast. The only problem is that they need the keys to be shared between anyone needing to pass messages, and it can be difficult to do this securely. Public key cryptography doesn't have the same key sharing problem. Unfortunately, it's very slow. The good news is that we can find a balance between the two. We can use public key cryptography, like RSA or Diffie-Hellman, to compute and share secret keys securely. They also offer server authentication and optionally client authentication. Secret key cryptography quickly encrypts and decrypts the bulk of the private information. Block ciphers like AES will need a mode of operation like CBC or GCM. These combine with a security protocol, SSL, TLS, IPsec or something else. This manages the secure network connection. And of course we can throw in a hashing algorithm like MD5 or one of the SHA algorithms to verify message integrity. So the result is that a secure connection will use several components. This combination is called a cipher suite. Cipher suites have long and complicated looking names like the examples we have here. The exact way that they're written can change depending on the product you're configuring, but they'll all look something like one of these. 
First up, we have a protocol, TLS in both occasions here. In the top one, we can see that it's version 1, while the second one isn't specific. Sometimes you'll see SSL here, which can mean SSL versions 2 or 3. Both are considered insecure, so you should avoid using them. We'll have a look soon at how to keep up to date with what's considered secure and what's not. Next, we see the public key algorithm. In the second example, this is DHE and RSA. These are used for exchanging session keys and for authentication. Notice that nothing's listed in the first one for this. It's not uncommon for a Cypher Suite name to omit some details. I'm honestly not sure why this happens. Anyway, I think it would be safe to assume that RSA is used in this example. Next is the bulk encryption cipher, AES in this example, and the size of the key that it uses. The keys are exchanged using the public key algorithm. Any block cipher will need a mode of operation, which is CBC and GCM in these examples. And finally, a hashing algorithm for integrity. It's pretty common to see some variant of SHA in most ciphers these days. So now when you're configuring a web server or some other network device and you see a cipher suite, you should be able to decode each of the components that it uses. Now let's see this process with a very simplified example. We're going to consider an HTTPS connection from a client to a web server. HTTP uses TCP, so the conversation will always start with a three-way handshake. But it's after that point that it gets really interesting. The client sends a hello message to the server, asking to start a secure session. As part of this message, the client sends a list of Cypher suites it's willing to support in order of preference. The message also includes a large random number, which will be used soon. From the list of Cypher suites in the client hello message, the server will select a Cypher that it is happy to use. That is, of course, assuming that there is a Cypher that they can agree on. For our example, we'll assume they agreed on a Cypher suite that uses RSA. The server then responds with a hello message of its own. This includes the ciphers it has chosen, its certificate, and a second random number. We haven't talked much about certificates, as honestly this is a large enough topic for another video, but in short, the certificate is a way for the server to share its public key with the client, and a way for the client to verify the server's identity. So the client now verifies the server's certificate. If you've ever seen a certificate error message in your browser, then you've seen what happens when there's a problem with the certificate. The client will now choose a third random number and encrypt it with the server's public key. It will then send this to the server. This number is called the pre-master key, which only the server can decrypt using its private key. The client and the server now have three random numbers. They then use these three numbers to calculate a series of session keys. They follow the same process when they do this, and they have the same numbers to start with, so they will arrive at the same result and have the same keys. The client and server now send a finish message to each other, and the secure connection is now established. They can now use the session keys that they generated, along with AES, or some other bulk cipher, to encrypt the rest of the HTTP connection. That's a simplified explanation on how this works. There may be some small variations depending on the settings and ciphers that were chosen. For example, we only talked about the client authenticating the server. Optionally, the server may also authenticate the client. There's an option to use Diffie-Hellman key exchange rather than just using RSA on its own. This is a more complicated but more secure method of calculating the session keys. We might be able to look at this in another video if you're interested. I've mentioned this several times now, that there are ciphers and algorithms that are no longer considered secure. This is because of flaws that are found over time, advancements in computing power, and so on. This continually changing landscape leads to a common expression. Security is a moving target. This means that just because something is considered secure today, does not mean that it will still be secure in a month's time. This leads to an important question. How do we stay secure? Well, first remember that ciphers and encryption is just one aspect of security. But these are the entire focus of this video, so that's what we're going to look at now. There are a few organizations that will give their recommendations on which ciphers and protocols they consider secure. One I'd like to show you is from the Open Web Application Security Project. I'll put a link to them in the description.
They break the Cypher Suites into categories A through D. To be the most secure, we only want to choose options from category A. They will also list the Cypher order with the best at the top. So when would you consider using categories B through D? There might be some cases where clients on your network do not support category A ciphers yet. If that's the case though, you should investigate whether you are able to update your clients. Now here's another site I'd like to show you. It's called SSL Labs, and we can use this to test our web servers. This goes through and scans your server for weaknesses, such as using insecure ciphers. This takes a while to go through, so I'm speeding up the process. The ratings go from A plus all the way down to F, and you also get a full report. This one here is a big failure, so let's take a look. First, there's a summary with some obvious problems. The two big ones are insecure protocols, SSL 2 and 3. These should always be disabled. Further down, we have certificate information. This part's actually looking pretty good. It's using a nice strong 2048-bit RSA key. And further down, we can see the supported ciphers. Some are listed as insecure and definitely shouldn't be used. RC4 in this case, which should be disabled entirely. The rest are listed as weak. So the guys managing this server should probably look at using some more secure ciphers. There's plenty more you can get from this report. So try running one of your own and having a look yourself. If you've just watched all three of these videos back to back, you've probably got a headache. We've gone through quite a lot in such a short time but I hope that you've been able to get something practical out of this. This certainly won't make you a security expert, but hopefully it has helped to give you some fundamentals which you can then use to improve the security in your own networks. Thank you so much for joining me for the basics of encryption.